Bring it on, tell us all the good stuff out. Go ahead, Senator. Get them going. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll do the good stuff on this end. <laughs> well, uh, I didn't have this. Okay, that's over. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't have this issue. No, I didn't have that this morning. <laughs> One of the things that uh, we tried to do this last session was to close a, a $1.3 billion gap. And uh, extremely difficult session. Uh, many of them that turned it out that this was the most difficult session they have ever spent. Uh, a lot of that simply deals uh, with just a, a loss of, of money and, and the way that we've done our money. Uh, we tried hard within the Senate this year to evaluate every off-the-top credit that was out there. And some of those we were able to get through. Uh, some of them we were not able to get through as far as restructuring our, our budget. Uh, there is no doubt we're probably looking at uh, at least a half billion dollar shortfalls going into next year. If you, if you count the 200 million we did in bonds for uh, ODOT, uh, which we bonded out regular projects, but went, went in and swept 200 million out of their funds to help balance the budget. 144 million we took out of the rainy day fund, about almost 100 million uh, in the uh, revolving accounts. Uh, so, we're starting off with a pretty good deficit this next year. We do a lot of core services uh, in the state of Oklahoma, uh, many of those through prisons, uh, some of those through mental health, Medicaid. A couple of my priorities this last uh, session was, was Common Ed and, and Medicaid. I started out the first of the session with Common Ed being number one. By the end of the session, Medicaid became our number one issue uh, because 25% cuts would have shut down every nursing home or every hospital within the area. and so able to beef it up and you can see on the appropriation sheet that I handed out that uh, actually was able to add a hundred million dollars. The problem with our Medicaid expenses, uh, it, it presently increases 60 to 80 million dollars per year over what we had the last year anyway. This year we've got a hundred million in there to stabilize the Medicaid cuts, keep our nursing homes open and keep our little hospitals open. Um, so definitely we didn't have the, the budget that anybody is, is happy with. Everybody is unhappy uh, with the budget. Uh, yet when you start with that big of a hole, uh, you do the best you can. Structural rebalancing, uh, this year we were able to get out of the, the Senate, uh, some of the, uh, the at-risk wells uh, was $137 million that we wanted to take out on the Senate side to bring that back in. Uh, the House capped it, I'll put a $12.5 million cap on it, so we got uh, about $125 million uh, this year out of those that went back in. Uh, we did the uh, double income tax reduction, uh, we were able to get that passed. Uh, the uh, earned income tax credit, I'm going to comment on that just a little bit, we're able to pass that. Uh, on the earned income tax credit, there's positives and negatives you can say about that. Uh, it has been misconstrued by some of the people who have written to me that we did away with the federal earned income tax credit. We don't have that power to do that, it's still federal. Oklahoma has a 5%, and out of that, it was unfunded uh, that we actually were able to pass. And so, in Oklahoma, if you're working and you pay money in, you qualify for a $600 earned income tax credit, but yet you only pay $400 into taxes, the bill says you're gonna get your $400 back, but you're not gonna get that extra 200. The bill also said if you paid zero taxes in, you're getting zero refunds. And uh, it was gonna save about $28 million a year. So that's one of those areas that we've done. I got a whole list of some of those credits we'll get into a little bit later. Uh, I was a little bit disappointed we didn't get anything out of wind. Uh, we thought we had an agreement with the leadership of the House that uh, we would get something out of wind this year. Uh, we had asked for, uh, just simply on the manufacturer uh, tax rebate, the Avalorum reimbursement, and just the zero emission, uh, to cap that two years early, and would save us about 300 million on the backside. Uh, we were unable to get that out of the house. So I think that's something we'll be looking at uh, this next year. So a lot of heavy lifting was done this year. Uh, it was, it's been a good year. I've enjoyed working with Jerry and Steve, and, and uh, for Will Oklahoma, and we have a good delegation of horses here. Uh, but it's going to be a more difficult year, I think, if we look into this next year, unless we can turn the oil and gas market around back in the state of Oklahoma. What do we say about diversification? We're in an oil and gas state, and uh, that's where we are at present time. I'm sure there'll be other questions, but later we might need to. Well, I, like he said, this is the worst session I ever went through. I, it, boy, it, it, was, it was very, very stressful to sit there and watch all these core services being cut and everything. Knowing that we had to, but it was just hard to do. Uh, of course, this is my last session. I've, I've enjoyed, I've really enjoyed serving the people of District 16 here in Oklahoma and all the rural areas.
the best bunch of people in the world. And but uh, uh, really and truly, I'm, I'm, term limits is not a bad thing, <laughs> as far as I'm concerned today. <laughs> I mean, really is. You know, I, you, you lose a lot of expertise out there with term limits, but uh, after this year, I was I was ready to leave. But uh, like I say, I've really enjoyed it. I've enjoyed all you folks. And, Trying to do the best I could. That's about all I got to say. <laughs> well, <laughs> now it starts. Right, so he'll start, and I just want people time. I have, I have to watch his heart. <laughs> yeah, watch his heart. I've got yeah. his monitor on. <laughs> got a little wound up this morning, a little moment, so I'll, <laughs> back. I'll go back to that. I'm going to touch on the tournaments. <laughs> you know, I, I, I remember the history of the term limits, and I was uh, part of an organization, a farm organization, that really promoted the term limits. We thought it was a great idea at the time. The members did, and I actually, I think I actually voted for them. But I think we instituted term limits for the wrong reasons. We, as we, we implemented those same term limits in our organization for the same wrong reasons. You know, uh, the reality is, every two years if you're in the House, or every four years if you're in the Senate, you have term limits. You know, if you're not doing a good job for your constituents, and they don't like what you're doing, somebody else wants to step up, you know, you're always term limited by the next election. And I think we as voters and citizens of the state of Oklahoma got lazy. And there were a few individuals I know one in, in the organization I've represented and one state senator that's not, that's not far from here that people didn't like, but their constituents continued to reelect them. So we thought our, we didn't agree with their constituents, so by golly, we were going to show them. And we instituted this term limits. And I, you know, they're, they're not all bad, but they're not all good either. They, that's a double-edged sword. And for example, in the House of Representatives, this next session, there's a possibility of being, there will be oh, 31 or 32 new ones, no matter what happens, uh, because of the ones that have quit and turned out. And if there's any upsets in any of the elections, you know, that could be higher. So, you know, you could go 35, 40, 40 out of 101 brand new Representative. Now, I don't know in the Senate what the number is. We got 12 senators. Well, I mean, it's not as bad over there, but you look in the House, when you bring in that many new people, it is, it's pretty disruptive because, you know, you're talking about individuals who have, don't know the ropes and, and uh, the term limits. I found that you have a lot younger um, legislators for the most part. And most of them are looking not, not only for their legislative, but they're looking for another career of young men. And they are very aggressive and they, so I don't know that it, it bodes the state well in term limits. I know they're probably gonna be here from now on, not gonna change, but I think the state may have uh, did itself a disservice by instituting the term limits. And I know the good side is, you know, people, so you get rid of some sorry representatives, maybe, but you also lose some darn good ones. And that puts a lot more power in the hands of those individuals who are the so-called bureaucrats that run, run the place up there. They, there's no institutional knowledge left as to why things happen. And when you don't have that, you have a tendency to repeat your mistakes that you've done before. So it's not, it's not a good thing. So, is there a mentor program from the uh, more experienced representatives to the young people? Not really. I mean, each, uh, each caucus hands it differently. We, we try to, you know, you try to put some of your new members under the wings of some of the other ones. But, you know, let's be honest, when you're, when you're an elected official, you're pretty independent. Mm -hmm. you, you think, it's hard to tell an elected official a whole lot of anything, because they, they think they pretty well know what's going on. Especially well, one of the young ones. When I was first first elected uh, back in 2004, we had a freshman orientation for a couple of days up there. And it, it was more informing about what went on 
how to, how to proceed with bills and things like that rather than anything else. And, but we, we've elected so many young guys that, and gals that has never had any life experiences whatsoever. You know, we've, we've elected people that 21 years old still living at home and never paid insurance, never had to do a budget, never worked had a job. out, never had a job. And got, but they worked in some political campaigns and learned how to play politics. And they were, they're very good politicians. And I've been up there now 12 years and I've served under six different speakers, which is usually unheard of. Usually you have one speaker for six or eight years, but I've had six different speakers. And every one of them has gone on to, to a bigger government job. Every one of them. Or tried to. Or tried to. How long have terminal that's been up there? Since 2004. I was the first class uh, that was the term that's brought in. You know, the term limit sounds good on the surface. But as you mentioned, uh, you have a chance to vote your that representative out or the senator out. But the biggest problem, and he mentioned it also, and I worked with Everett for almost 40 years, um, is the bureaucratic influence. So as you come in, I thought we'd have a new general come in. And he would have to totally rely, other than uh, his briefing he got at the headquarters level on the bureaucrats that existed. And I know at the higher echelon level, uh, you become reliant on those bureaucrats and begin to run the show if you don't watch it. Because the uh, corporate memory, um, your, your experience isn't there yet. No. And you've got to rely on someone to begin to run the show. <clears throat> and that's why I'm always against term limits. Well, see, right now, you have lobbyists up there that's been there for 20, 25 years. And you have staff people that's been there for 10 or 15, 15 or 20 years. And, and we have the greatest staff in the world. Don't let me, I'm not trying to mislead you there. But they could run the show. The lobbyists and the staff could, could actually be in charge of the whole legislature. Sometimes like that. And, well, <laughs> and we depend on, on our staff a whole bunch of them. But we also enjoy that with over the years, because the legislature wanted to regulate themselves, they did more off the top money that went into agencies. And we said we don't want to have our control over that money because we might use it for a different purpose or whatever. And some of that reasoning was probably good. But when you can join with all the off the top money that we have out there, and then you can join that with term limits. Uh, we were actually to a point now that as a senator or representative, you call a state agency, they might not even return your phone call <laughs> because they're already getting their money directly. Uh, you're more of an aggravation than you are a representative of the people. And so you find yourself almost having to introduce some wild bill about doing away with their entire board or whatever just to get their attention so that they'll come back in and talk to you. And so one of the things I'm working for is bringing a lot of that off the top money back in underneath the people's control and just simply so these agencies will respond to you. Well, and then those well, agencies are going to become self-funded, yeah, and they're non-appropriated agencies. agencies. And where, where, where did they get that money to begin with? To make them self-appropriated from you and I. That's right. Kind of like an insurance commissioner this yeah. year is going non-appropriated, right. attorney general is going non-appropriated, and uh, no, that didn't pass. So, I don't pass the house or not. I don't think it did. No, no, the no, thing no. about it is, as much as he, is he going to pay for his own lawsuits then? <laughs> He's got a lawsuit against everybody that ever bill out there. Everybody in the country. So. Yeah. The Attorney General cut him 50 percent, 51 percent there, and cut him in his budget. So what what happens now after we know this year was a pretty rough year? Probably assume next year is going to be a pretty rough year too, right? What do you I think it'll be. What we hope to do on the Senate side is go back in for more of these off the top reforms. Uh, this year we were able to do some of the, uh, the uh, tax credits for like the oil, we were doing some of the job incentives. We really got to look at wind. Uh, every state that deals with wind, we offer every credit that's available. California cut two of their wind credits this last year. Uh, a number, Texas cut a number of their credits. Kansas cut a number of their credits because can't afford it. Uh, that's got to be major, that's got to be our number one issue. The difficulty with that is, is that previous legislators made a deal. And so the question is, do we go back in and say, we know they made a deal with you, but we're going to change that deal that's out here? Or do we go ahead and let that deal ride out? And it's like what we did last year on the ad reimbursement. 
Uh, we did sunset that for five years, but that means if you go from last year all the way into 2020 and you get in that last year, now you're 2025. And we're still doing the Avalon reimbursements uh, that go back out. And we, we wrote a check this last year for 135 million. It's back out to the counties of Western Oklahoma on Avalon reimbursement. Uh, so we've got to win, we've got to bring that in somehow. That, that cost us about $253 million this year, just in wind, those credits. And uh, I would like to see it go to a, a gross production tax, just like oil and gas. And it's across the state, it's more equalized across the state. Uh, that, that would help us a great deal. We've got to quit using one-time funds. And we've been doing it for a number of years. And uh, the rainy day fund, we still got uh, a little over 200 million in there. We only took 144 million. Uh, that will be available again this next year. We'll probably have to dip into that as well. The only thing that's gonna be of oil and gas comes back. And we're gonna get it. But I understand if it comes back, even like uh, Representative Copeland talked about this morning, if we hit $60 a barrel, we're only producing about half what we were producing anyway. So you're still figuring about $30 a barrel that's gonna be out there. Uh, we're up to down, uh, uh, Dr. Miller's, we're at a 17 month low. 17 years. Is that 17 year low on oil and gas uh, production receipts that are coming in. If you look through the 1616 bill I gave you, the big one, uh, all the first few pages is all the federal and uh, state and local money that goes into every one of these programs. So we're able to appropriate about a $7 billion this year, $6.8 billion, but we actually live on about $24 billion in the state of Oklahoma, which is, uh, uh, kind of gives a full picture. One area that is, I think, for Republicans that we're going to have to really look on is health care. And we have the uh, Rebalancing Act from Nico Gomez that was out there this year. I think that thing needs to be tweaked uh, in some areas. We're going to see uh, whether Mr. Trump becomes president and what they do with health care on the federal level. But we spend over a billion dollars on Oklahoma on just Medicaid, on that health care. And uh, there's some federal funds that are out there. You say a billion? A billion, would it be, is what we spend in Oklahoma. Oklahoma taxpayer money on Medicaid. And uh, so we've got to, we've got to somehow access some federal funds. And those that are against health money from the federal, they're, they're not against federal funds for highways. They're not against federal funds for schools. It's just making sure that we're packaged in such a way uh, that we're able to sustain what we start. And, and quite honestly, there are those that says we can't sustain that if we bring it on. I've not seen the figures that says we can't sustain that yet. And you guys know for two years I've studied every figure I come up with. Uh, because I want to be able to see more than just the rhetoric that is out there. But our health care cost, our prison cost, and our mental health cost is eating us up. That, that's our big expenditures and they're flat eating up every bit of revenue that we have coming in. And, uh, and then we have done things where we have cut our revenue, just like the last tax cut that, that kicked in. We had a big push from Senator Mays and a number of us on the uh, Senate side. We were trying to get that back on the table. I even asked the government directly. I put that back on the table this year because it was if your income reached a certain level, that trigger was supposed to kick in and you'd have a tax reduction. Well, if you have two revenue failures in a year, evidently the triggers were faulty. And so we were trying on the Senate side to say the triggers were faulty and so therefore let's do away with it. We can get zero traction with it. If you said the triggers were okay, now you're raising taxes. And according to state question 640, passed in 1992, you can't raise taxes. First I had to start in the House, had to be passed by supermajority, and then had to go to the vote of the people. So we were trying to do the trigger thing. Uh, I think it was wrong for us to do that tax cut and uh, to leave that off the table. Uh, we got $147 million that should have been there this year. And it's simply not there. We tried in the Senate side to make sure that the next tax cut doesn't kick in. Uh, I think it had a little trouble getting traction uh, over on the House side. But we could not continue to cut our income and increase our expenses. And that's what we've been doing for a number of years. We've been cutting income and increasing expenses, which is deep, uh, digging us a deeper hole uh, to be able to get into. And those are going to be challenges for this next year from where I sit. Well, when I, I was elected, I've been there eight years. My first got to the budget was like 7.1. And it's been about seven, seven, two. This is the smallest budget, six, seven, mm -hmm. that I've ever seen in the state. And you think about that, eight years, and for no growth now, quite a bit of a reduction in growth. Now, I, granted, a lot of those agencies, even though they don't get appropriated money, we passed a lot of fees and, yes. and licensing, licensing and things that that these agencies have used to supplement their, their departments, whatever it might be.
but they have operated on pretty much a flat budget. I, one thing that bothered me is I mentioned this morning with Maury, when I, when I first was elected, the pie chart of the revenue coming to the state, about 30% of it was income tax, about 30% of it was sales tax, and about 30% of it was gross production tax. That pie chart has got as old. The, the sliver for gross production tax is so small you can't really see it on the pie chart. Some, somehow we've got to bring, we're an oil and gas state, right? And we need to support the industry. But they need to support the state as well. And we somehow we've got to replace some of that revenue from, from oil and gas that we used to get. And I, I think we went way too far when we cut our gross production tax from 7 to 2 percent, or our incentive. The people don't realize gross production tax in Oklahoma is still 7 percent. But for the 36 months that well is in, in operation, the first 36 months it drops to 2 percent. So somehow we've got to, we've got to go back and reevaluate what we've done there. What was the reasoning behind doing that? Well, tw about 25. 30 years ago, I don't know, way back when the horizontal drilling was experimental and was new, new science at the time. They approached the uh, legislature and said, hey, this is experimental and we need, we need an incentive to do it because it's, it's tricky stuff and we need some reason to do it. I, to me, it's always funny. You know, we, we say there are a lot of poor services out there important to us. We don't throw incentives out to them like that. But the oil and gas industry, we did. So they instituted, at that time, any horizontal well drilled that was for 48 months. And for the first 48 months of production, they only paid 1%. And that was about to expire this last year. Well, two years ago, the oil and gas industry came in and said, you know, if, if this goes back up to seven, we'll leave the state. You all have got to cut it down. So in the grand bargaining at the time, we felt like on the House that they were going to probably go down to three and a half, four percent. Well, they got it, they had negotiated it down and it passed down to two percent, but that's all wells now. The vertical wells used to pay the seven percent no matter what, so, but now even they only pay two percent in the first 36 months of production. So all new production on any well drilled in the state of Oklahoma for the first 36 months, for three years, is only taxed at 2%. And there was an article in the Daily Oklahoma that was trying to defend that. And their argument was, well, they would have been less economical, so there would have been less, less wells drilled. Let's say that half the wells weren't drilled under the old system. Say we went back to the old system where it's 7% straight across the board. If you only drilled half the wells at 7%, you had more revenue in the state than you did drilling 100% of the wells at 2%. And you still got half your oil in the ground. So how is the state hurt by doing that? I mean, I, I know you need to incentivize them, and I'm all for helping the oil and gas industry, but I think we've gone to the pendulum that's swung way too far. And I think a lot of people realize that, and it's going to have to come back. We, we tried to introduce legislation that would index the gross production tax to the price of oil. And when oil's down like this now, the gross production tax goes down, but as, as oil creeps up, the gross production tax would go up to the maximum of 7%. So when, when the price is good, and they're making more money, they can, and can afford to pay the taxes, they would pay the taxes and then say to get the revenue. So even when oil was over $100 a barrel, they are still only getting that 2%? For 36 months. Now after 36 months, it would jump to 7%. And a lot of people have the misconception that it take a super majority to do that, but it only takes a simple majority because you're not, you're just doing away with an incentive. What's, what's the deal for them to just cap those wells and just go and dig another well? But you have to have to be in production. In production. Mm -hmm. And my understanding, that's before that I got there, that the independent oil producers have to get the vertical wells that went there because yeah. the horizontal wells were basically the big guys. Right. And so oil IPA said, let's go ahead and include some of these independents, like for us, we landers all and a number of others. 
that would do the vertical wells. There was really only three three oil companies that wanted it. It was the big three in the state: Chesapeake, Chesapeake, Devon, and Continental. Mm -hmm. All the other oil companies said, "Hey, the tax is not a real. It's kind of like the income tax deal. Everybody, everybody, you know, state income tax is too high. It's driving people away. Nobody's ever. I've never. I haven't had a complaint from one person in my district about how high the state income tax is." And we keep saying, well, we've got to cut the state income tax. And these three wanted to cut that. It, you know, it, it makes the bottom line look better. But most, a lot of the other oil companies and independents weren't for it. And kind of like the senator said, to get them on board, they, they included them from that 7% down to the 2%, which kind of threw them in. Hmm. What's that magical uh, uh, dollar per barrel that's, that's required? that whole company say they, they would need to have. Uh, oh, the break-even point they say is about $43. Because I was told 75 Well, now, what was it? $75 dollars per barrel. To, on that break-even on gross production, what, $700 a barrel? That you well, <laughs> it was, was expensive. It was way up there. Way up there. To replace the revenue uh, to that 30% level that I was talking about, where a third, 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 roughly, it would take $700 a barrel of oil because the incentives and everything is cut it so low. Jeremy, you might notice too on some of your accounts that I don't, don't know whether you have any uh, oil and gas leases or not or, or actually get oil checks. Uh, my wife has some oil royalty income and they still hold out 7% gross production out of her taxes. Hmm. That's only the producer but, that gets that yeah, percentage. Right. It's not the that's, oil company. The royalty owner doesn't get that tax break. Hmm. Now, the producer does. So they're, they're making more than, uh, way more than 6%. <laughs> One of those companies owns more land in North Dakota than any other person. They right. They're at any time. It does cost more horizontally drilled, but I think the incentive's there. 11%. 11% uh, gross production tax. Well, their argument is up there it's easier to produce. Yeah. Right. I mean, there's always, everybody's got a reason why they need a special deal. I mean, it's... <laughs> Make more money. It's money. <laughs> Agreed. Oh, this uh, going back to your guys' uh, talking about the bond, the two hundred million dollar bond for yes. the Department of Transportation. How many years we going to pay that back, and what's the percentage interest we got to pay? Back? Don't know yet. Do Sixteen years, I think. Uh, Sixteen. So, uh, because I've heard ten. I talked with you guys. Know Bobby's ten. Uh -huh. Okay, I, I met with him, and he, and he was talking ten. And uh, was it two well, percent? I think the well, Van B and chairman in the house told us around 16, but it's whatever the bond. Okay. The bond the company, company the bond advisors has to come up with that. They will work the deal out. And they'll be selling those bonds in increments between 16 and 23. Okay. And so it's not like they're going to go out and sell all 200 million yeah. just right away. Okay. Uh, here's a complete list of all the projects that they're going to be doing. I, yeah, that is kind of your plan. Comes time for that. Well, these are this ones that they. Added up to 200 million. Okay. They they come out of the eight year plan. Eight year Okay. And so as they get ready to do that particular project, then they will sell enough bonds out of that 200 million to do the, those projects. Okay. So the bonds there, I mean, those are, are basically the collateral for the bonds. Yes, that's, that's correct. correct. Okay. Yeah, these projects are all new projects. Okay, that explains it. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, on the oil price, it depends on who you talk to. Whenever I talk to Larry Nichols uh, with uh, Devin, uh, he's about 43, 44 dollars a barrel. Harold Ham. Uh, because of what they have going on there in the mid 40s, 50s, you talk to small producers, they get closer to 70 to get back. Uh, the struggle, not all of them, they have capped so many wells and shut down wells. And it's like Larry Nichols said, if oil prices go back up, it's not like flipping a switch and turning everything back on. Uh, because they've cannibalized some of the wells that are out there, uh, plugged some of the other wells, and so it's going to be a while before we get that back up. But with the international market and even with uh, OPEC meeting earlier, and they've decided to leave everything in a steady flow for them, so they stay within the market themselves. Uh, Iran oil, that's also on the market at 2.5 million barrels per day above what we're consuming. Uh, we've got a lot of world influences right now holding our, our market prices down. And so, you see Oklahoma's kind of shot themselves in the foot. Basically, we, we've not helped ourselves in some of those areas, I, I would agree. There's a lot of world influences right now on the oil market that we have no control over. Uh, one of the good things is we're now allowed to export our crude out of here, and uh, I think that's helping some. Uh, at least get started. Is there a committee that, that meets kind of like an economic committee or 
what do you call it, uh, each, each house or each division has probably one that goes out and says, you know, Arkansas is doing good at this or Missouri or Texas, you know, tourism or whatever it may be for economic uses. Is there a group of you all that go out and do that? There, uh, of course, you've got commerce that That's works in there. You know, the Department of Commerce works there. Um, not legislators. There's not, there's not a legislative committee that, that goes out and looks. Uh, the Lieutenant Governor basically works with tourism. Uh, they may be out looking at some things that are going on, uh, able to close some sales whenever they're coming in and doing it. Uh, but we don't have anything legislative like that. No, the only thing we have is like in our committee meetings for uh, agencies or uh, different uh, economic development uh, mm -hmm. and things like that. They may come in and have people come in and talk to us. Mm -hmm. uh, agency directors like your Department of uh, Secretary of Education might come in to us and talk to us about that what's going on in other parts of the country in the same way with natural resources. So how, well, I guess what I was trying to say is how, how pro proactive are we in getting a Google to, to come to Oklahoma or, or something like that? I guess we do have somebody that's out there doing it. Department of Commerce and Labor, and the, not Labor, but Department of uh, Tourism are really, really good people. They work, they work really hard on that. And they've recently, the office in the same building, so they share a lot of staff now, Tourism and Commerce. <coughs> They're under the same hand now, aren't they? Yeah, the secretary's not good. Not, not, not good. But then, then she, she directs the commerce and then the <coughs> director of still directs tourism, but we're all in <coughs> her cabinet position. And we always talk about Henrietta being a great location here. If you think about our state of Oklahoma, we're a great location in the country. So it's always when people say, why is Henrietta not as big as Shawnee or McAllister? And you know, almost the argument could be made, why is Oklahoma not as busy as the port city? Because we, we're right in the middle of everything. I, I didn't know if there was kind of like a group or community. Well, we are. We had some of the most drug traffic coming. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah we're, we're number one. We're number one. We're number one. We're number one. But you, where the cars are, a lot of work over to New, uh, Newport and Caduce, I just heard the other day. And they moved, they moved more tons of material, uh, barge material, out than any, pack, any years past. So, incoming and outgoing both. The thing that scares me about it, we have no vision in this state of this country anymore for anything. I mean, you think back, you know, when, when Senator Kerr was there and they dreamed up this, our lake system and the navigation system. I mean, that was, they spent a lot of federal money doing that and it was somebody, you know, it's paying huge dividends now to our state because of their vision. But we have nobody, we don't have statesmen. I think vision is what actually Jerry was talking about. You know, what is the, because we see, and I think about that, because we've, we've, fallen, we've fallen back into a survival picture. That's right. I mean, that's all we're in now. It's just, we're just trying to meet tomorrow, just living yeah. day to day. And, and that's from the city level on top, I think. All the way. And it's a, it's a real problem. You look around, it seems like other states, and you mentioned Arkansas, um, uh, they, they seem to be producing some things we're not in the area of uh, attractions, uh, communities. Um, and I'm not sure how whole based they are or anything like that. But uh, yeah, very little. I mean, I'm sort of, I've lived there for seven years, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> but the thing about it is, is that uh, that is a, I think it's a lack of vision, as you mentioned there. We're, we're just, and I don't know what's contributed to that, but we are in a survival mode, it seems like. Well, can you imagine in Washington, D.C., when Senator Kerr and McClellan proposed this waterway in Oklahoma, yeah. from Oklahoma to New Orleans to Mississippi, can you imagine what, what they got called up there day after day? Are we dummies? You know, yeah. what do you think you can do, dig a water? <laughs> Waterway all the way to the center of the United States, and they did it. It has really paid off for them. As far as uh, agriculture products, we've got a shipping market now that we used to be depending on trucks. We took no telling how many trucks off off the roads. Well, I and you can't and tell it. The road system. I yeah, came up with that the one, uh, you know. the interstate uh, highway system. I mean, we we've got some good good government programs. I-40 and I-75, like I've always said ever since I've been elected, is in a prime spot. 35 miles of waterway, and 
right here on I-49, State Highway 75. Uh, it just couldn't get any better location. From a retail perspective, uh, and it's always hindsight, with the lack of access roads on I-40 and 75, contributed tremendously. Well, see, I think that's what saved your downtown. Well, it, that's, that was the idea, I think. Yes. Uh, but now, it's, uh, Hindrance. It's a hindrance. You look at all Moggies with their their excess system to 75 and what's happened to their downtown compared to what's happened to Henrietta's downtown. We have an average of 8,800 vehicles per day right, travel downtown. How downtown? Yeah. How many goes by on 75? 75. Out of 17 to 18,000. And uh, about the same number plus on I 40. But <clears throat> The problem that we have right now is deterioration of the infrastructure uh, of the buildings and things like that. People are passing us by, even though they travel by our businesses downtown, they uh, travel on the east end, on, to the east end, and, uh, and then on to Delphi or wherever. So we're not, where people want to locate, and I should say businesses want to locate, is not downtown. Mm -hmm. your, your, your national retailers. Well, I was going to say, your, your big companies are forcing them to move out of the interstate. They, they're they're wanting that the interstate flow because they can get that, that consistent dollar. Uh, and uh, But when the, when the I-40 came through, again, we didn't create the access roads. We looked at Shawnee, so Shawnee has that. You look at the other communities that have that. And uh, so it's, 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 a, it's a barrier right now in a way. You know, I-40 can be a blessing to us, or it can be like a China wall that just go right by. And um, right now, it's our, our challenge here in Rada is to, uh, again, gain sewage and things like this. On the south side of I-40. And then, once you get that traffic flow, how do you get that traffic flow to migrate on down to your downtown area? So we have to create some sort of attraction for that. And that magic attraction hasn't gotten there yet. Uh, even though we know we have a great park uh, park facility which needs improvements. But uh, it's a real challenge. I mean, you look at this great location, but great location for what? And then how do you manage that great location? And I see that as a challenge. But uh, retail development, uh, I think we're a great location for that. Uh, for uh, uh, distribution of things, uh, a good location for that. But that doesn't generate the dollar that we need, like retail will bring to us. What, one of the areas of uh, economic development is quality of life issues. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, companies now move because you offer quality of life issues. You take like Oklahoma City and Tulsa, whether it be in the MAPS program or something, they have developed quality of life. And so when the employees are off, they can go downtown Tulsa, go downtown Oklahoma City, enjoy good restaurants, enjoy different nightlife, different things are going on. Our small rural communities, we just don't have any nightlife. It comes 5 o'clock and somebody flips a switch and we're done. Yeah. And that really impairs your economic development. Yeah, it's a different, uh, the, the quality of life issues that if a customer comes in and says, I've got this business, I'm looking out for my employees, what do you have to offer? And when well, you don't have them all, you don't have these. So those quality of life issues that are very important to them, really not important to many more rural people. Right. Uh, they can travel to those and come back, and come back to the rural environment they prefer to live in. So it, it's a real challenge, however we do, have positive attributes that we can sell. And what I've found so far since I've been here is uh, the, the uh, baby boomer retiree, uh, the, the affluent retiree, is the, are looking for the same thing as the young up and coming business people are, uh, or professionals are. The other thing, we had a, um, uh, Roger Ballinger talked to us, uh, to our chamber the other day, and I wanted him to share some of the things that. He's experienced as city manager at Omogi. One of the questions that I had for him was, how many of these new businesses that's coming into Omogi have been facilitated by through economic development, and how many have actually been recruited? Well, they've been facilitated. Because Omogi has those, that developable land, they have infrastructure in place and so on like that. But uh, one of the comments that Roger made was that 80% their professionals that work in Mogi live outside of Mogi. And we've been looking at our area, uh, how we could develop a place that would grasp those 80, that 80%. And, uh, and we're still playing with that idea. And that's a housing, a 
a quality, quality housing project and improving our quality of life in certain areas. And uh, but that, that's very interesting when you mention 8% professionals live outside of the world. I always thought it was ironic that we as a state legislature, we kind of, we kind of, we're the head of the state. The state's where we do it. You take the two biggest metropolitan cities we have in Oklahoma, Tulsa and Oklahoma City. We talk about cutting taxes and cutting revenues and what have you. They've developed by raising taxes. You know, their, their maps plan in Oklahoma City, I, I can remember when you go downtown Oklahoma City, it's a scary place to go. <laughs> yeah. You didn't you didn't drive downtown <laughs> Oklahoma <laughs> City and you don't you didn't walk around. But now you know they they voted the tax on themselves, they could they use that money um, and develop it. And Oklahoma and Tulsa used their Vision 2025 20, or whatever they call it now. Vision money the same way. So, you know, you have to invest in yourself. And the state, the state's got off on this tangent of cutting revenue and not investing in themselves and just cutting and cutting. But you know, we as a people have got to start investing in ourselves again. And you, know, you gotta have you gotta have a workforce. Quality of life is important, but you gotta have a trained workforce, an educated workforce. Well, Senator Jolly made a statement, you know, when we cut higher education as much as we did, well, that's okay because tuition in Oklahoma is too low anyway. Too low? <laughs> you know, he's got to do with college. Got to do college. college. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, I can't believe that he made that statement and I didn't hear it in its full context. And maybe you, know. you can. You can expand on that a little bit, Senator, but I, when I heard that, I couldn't believe that. I mean, you know, the legislature used to have to approve tuition increases. I thought it was, I thought it was a huge mistake when they gave that to the college to let them do it. Because the legislature's going to get criticized no matter what. If you raise tuition, the legislature shouldn't have done it. If you, if you don't raise it well, the legislature should have done it. should have given more money. But you, you give it that authority to them, and if they raise it, well, you know, and we're raising it because the legislature didn't give us enough money. The legislature going to get blamed anyway. <laughs> so I thought the legislature should have kept that and controlled those tuition increases. But, you know, anytime you raise the cost of our kids getting quality education, you hurt the workforce of the state. The state ought to be encouraging more kids and helping them not not having them come up with huge debt when they get out of college. So I was I was shocked when when Senator Boy, you, said that. You may know this, but in Oklahoma City, the highest uh, tax city city tax in in the state sales tax. Uh -huh. It's in it Tulsa one. It's well, they're both pushing close to to ten. Well, we're pushing close to ten right now. We're going to eleven percent. Muskogee's ten. Yeah. yeah. So we're we're on the whole miles over ten. I mean, I've got a bunch of my my yeah. district that's They're over ten, which which bothers me with this one cent sales tax well, that, education. I that's mean. scary right there. Because see, right now ten percent a person can calculate very rapidly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. At least most people can. That what they're going to be paying in sales tax, and they they make a big determination. Do I do I go to to, to a brick and mortar or do, do I go to my Amazon? Yeah. And that's a huge issue right there. Huge issue. And um, but uh, I'm I'm very concerned about that one that one percent. And uh, in multiple ways. One, is it going to go where it's supposed to go? And number two, now we're going to be at for the most part eleven percent. And is that the direction we really need to go? And again, especially when we have so much online sales competing with us. But keep in mind also that that bill says that you keep education where it is right now. So did all and, the rest uh, of those bills, Roger. And so if you do the one percent, you'll keep them right there with it. If, if that is honored, and I'll say if that is honored, that means the rest of your agencies are going to cut what we did. The problem is when you keep it right, if you kept it right there for six years, mm -hmm. it's a drop because you haven't kept up with sure, inflation. So that's the problem. The budget's been flat for eight years. I've been there. You know, it's been flat, all right. Mm -hmm. But inflation has cut into all of the departments, and we, you know, we have. Uh, well, on, on the sheet that I handed out to you, just kind of overview of the budget. You got a budget. You just have to look down through there and say, which one of those do we not want to do? Yeah. 
And because that, those are what we have to look at and say, what are we going to be cutting and how much is going to be cut? When you look at college tuition, we're, we're in the bottom five as far as college tuition payments. Uh, that, that's, that's done the bottom 5% of the nation. And so there's a little bit of room to raise that. Uh, I think in college, the struggle is, and, and again, done before I got there, we write the higher regents one check, and uh, that's what they get. It's up to the regents then where they put that money out. And so we're not dealing with like OU or OSU. We're really dealing with like OSU, IT, Connors. They really get hit hard on a lot of these cuts. And as a legislature, we're not able to say, okay, we're going to cut OU and OSU this much money. And, uh, but we want Connors, we want all the rural colleges taken care of. We, we can't do that. And uh, like Steve said, we get the blame for all of it. But that's totally. Is there totally any way to regain control of what the higher regions are doing? Because I hear these projects that are going on at some of the local community colleges, and it's like thirty thousand dollars for a flower bed. Mm -hmm. And you know, we're going to beautify the campus. And which there's nothing wrong with that. But when we're talking about you know thousands of dollars, and then we're going to raise tuition, right? Because we didn't get enough money from the state government. It to me seems a little bit ironic, and I know I come from that, that higher ed, but on the private side, so mm -hmm. I have maybe a different perspective of it. But it, it does bother me that there isn't that oversight of where the dollars are going. And well, should we let the board of regents is twenty. Most of them by the governor, aren't they? All of them, all of them all by, by the governor, mm -hmm. and uh, it's their whim. It's the governor's whim of who gets appointed, hmm. and I don't know when we lost control. Of the higher board, of higher regions, or regions board. So. I received pamphlets uh, from various universities in the state, mm -hmm. various programs that are some of the highest quality they ever produce. The pamphlets? Oh, yeah. But of low value. Yeah. Yeah. You all see the stuff we get out there. <laughs> if you look into the bureaucracy that's taking place, it would be in colleges or wherever, the first programs that they cut are programs that's going to cost people to holler because then they hire us, they get the rest of their money. If you remember a few years ago, we were cutting bills to senior citizens. Mm -hmm. And uh, they could have cut other places. The senior citizens vote, they scream, and so they get their money restored. Well, the same way the cigarette tax and the health care. Yeah. I mean, they, they threatened us 25% cut. All the nursing homes are going to shut down. Scared those people to death. You know, in reality, it wasn't in the Senate, but in the House side, that money was in the budget the whole time. So it was there. there. <laughs> they are already made dollars. So we just do a lot off of fear. <laughs> fear. <laughs> we, we don't do anything. Um, we got about five minutes. <laughs> All right. Well, good. Um, as we do that, we did this morning, and I want to do one here. Uh, Jerry is term limited out, and uh, Jerry's done a, a great job for 12 years. It's been my opportunity to work with him for two. Uh, we see a lot of division that takes place on a, a national level in the Republican and Democrats. Number one, we really don't have that here in, in Oklahoma. Uh, we do a lot of talking. We, we do have a lot of rhetoric that bounces back and forth. And, and uh, there's a, a lot of times that Steve and I are able to sit down and just really sharpen each other's sword because he looks at something a little bit different than the way that I do. And 99.9% and .9 of the time, He's always wrong. I'm the negotiator. But uh, it has been a pleasure working uh, with both. That's a lot of work. This morning's time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's been a pleasure going down. But uh, but uh, we do want to recognize uh, Jerry and uh, so Steve and I together. Um, citation recognition for Representative Jerry Shoemaker. Whereas uh, Representative Jerry Shoemate was elected to the Oklahoma House in 2004, whereas Representative Shoemate served on numerous House legislative committees during his 12 years tenure, which ends in November 2016, whereas Representative Jerry Shoemate was dedicated entirely servant to the people of the House District and continue to reelect him through the full term allowed by law as a member of the House of Representatives, and whereas the Oklahoma legislator would like to express our congratulations to Representative Jerry Shoemate for his many faithful, dedicated years to the people of his district. Wishing well in his most deserved retirement. Now, therefore, pursuant to the motion of Senator Roger Thompson, Representative Steve Copeland, the legislator of the great state of Oklahoma, stands to Representative Jerry Shoemate. Sincere congratulations and directs this citation of recognition be presented. Thank you, sir. Thank you. We'll get it after. So, I'm sure he'd like to make a speech. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad it's over. <laughs>
<laughs> Not really. I've really enjoyed, like I say, serving people in this district. And uh, I know whoever takes my place will, be, will feel the same way about serving the people in this district because they are good, good people. Thank you all for electing me for the last six terms. Well, we want to thank you so much as the state of the Chamber of Commerce here in Henrietta. Jerry, you've been wonderful to work with. Thank you, great representative. Thank you. Thank you all very much for, I guess it's the last one of this year, right? Sure. So I want to come back. <laughs> That's where I have a special session. Yeah. <laughs> thank you all. I'm going to vote against that special session. <laughs> Whenever we start next year, there's a good possibility Ronnie will be setting up here and, and, and I've already talked and he's going to have all the questions. Yeah. <laughs>